Welcome to the second video on this turret aimer that I've built and in this video I'll be explaining the mechanical parts of both the turret itself and the control unit as well as the electronics inside. First I'll start with the turret itself. As you can see it's completely 3D printed from black PLA plastic and there are a few main parts to the construction of this turret. This top cover is completely for aesthetics and is detachable. And you can see there's a 45 degree angle here, which fits in perfectly with a 45 degree angle on the part below it. So it self-centers and sits in place when it's put on. And below here are two main parts. There's this part on top, which rotates. And then there's the part at the bottom, which is the base. As I've said, this turret doesn't actually shoot anything. It's just moving an empty barrel that's connected to nothing, up and down and left and right. And this displays the output of the calculation on how a real projectile should be aimed. To move the gun barrel up and down, this motor is used. And this can turn like this, up and down. And to move it left and right, there's a motor down here that's attached to the base. And when that rotates, the entire top section along the, with the rotor and the barrel moves left and right. You might notice this section here with a jagged edge. That's a piece of the 3D print which I had to manually cut out because it was interfering with the piece above. I originally also had a 45 degree angle between the pieces that rotated and that caused it to be stuck so I had to manually cut that out. And here's an image of the cross section of the entire turret section. As you can see, the different components are marked with different colors and the 45 degree angles allow them to spin around and self-center. This USB port is what connects the turret to the control unit using a USB-A to USB-A wire. This USB connector comes out and is split into the four wires that are within USB wires. Two of these wires are power and ground, and the other two wires, which normally would be used for data in a USB wire, is in this case used as the two signal wires for the two servo motors. And this is a complete abuse of the USB standard because none of the wires are used for what they are actually supposed to be used for. And a USB-A to USB-A wire should never actually exist there should always be one side being a USB-A connector and another side being either USB-B or micro-USB. This cover can be put back on. And that's the entirety of the turret. So now moving on to the control unit, the part that houses the microcontroller, as well as all the inputs. This is the part that actually does all the calculations and sends it off again using USB port to the turret to move it. The top panel is a single piece of stainless steel which has been laser cut and laser engraved and bent to an angle. Here's a picture of how the stainless steel part looked when I first got it. And as you can see it's quite dirty. So here's how it looked after some scrubbing with some soap. And now onto the wooden parts. Wooden parts are used for both sides, the back, as well as the base. These are cut out of pieces of pine and they're glued together using wood glue. I can't actually show any video of the inside because the inside is very short on space and there are lots of wires that are tangled up. So it's very difficult to close up together and I don't really want to go through the very long process of making sure everything fits together when I close it back up. So the only thing I can show in this video are some pictures that I've taken during the assembly process. The base of the control unit is secured onto the main thing using four wood screws. And these screw onto four knockdown fittings, which are shown here, which have been cut out of a piece of wood. To reinforce the joints between the metal parts and the wood parts, both on the side and on the back, wooden strips and epoxy glue are used However, because of some clearance issues, the glue hasn't been strong enough to hold the metal down and a gap has developed on this one side. 
Now onto the specific components that are on the top panel. I'll start from the left and move over to the right. Three of the six inputs are controlled by these linear potentiometers. And they slide up and down just like the controls on an audio controller. You can see the one to the left over here controls projectile speed. And that's displayed at the very top of the display over here. And as I move that potentiometer, the value changes. The interesting thing about these linear potentiometers is that they don't have a linear value, meaning movements over here creates a much smaller change in value than movements in the middle. And similarly, movements at the very top also creates a very small change in value, which gives it a greater resolution near the extremes. This control ranges between 0 and 100, but when I set the value to roughly 5 meters per second, you can see that it's already about 30% up. Similarly, if I set it to about two thirds of the way up, it's already at about 95 meters per second. This means there's a lot of resolution near the extremes. Next are these dial switches, which control the order of magnitude of these inputs. This one here controls the order of magnitude of these two inputs, which are about speed. And this one here control the order of magnitude of this one input, which is the enemy's distance. The three remaining inputs are just ordinary rotary potentiometers. They spin and feel just like the normal potentiometers, and their output value is linear, unlike the linear potentiometers. Next are the two OLED displays that displays information. This one here displays the six inputs that are being read from this section. And this one here displays the calculated outputs, which have been calculated by the Raspberry Pi Pico on the inside. This LED indicates whether or not the target is out of range, or said another way, whether or not the shot is achievable with the current settings. If it is achievable, then the LED turns off. If it isn't, it turns on. The logic on when to turn this off or on is explained further in the video about the code that controls this turret aimer, which can, which can be found by clicking the top right corner over here. This entire section over here is the automatic part, meaning the user inputs six pieces of data and the computer controls all the ballistics. But you can also switch it to manual mode, in which case these inputs are completely ignored and the only thing that controls the turret is this joystick over here. Now I don't have it plugged in, so nothing is happening, but you can see the input display has changed to display the movement of the joystick, and the output has changed to display the position of the turret. This joystick can also rotate in a third dimension, and also has a button at the very top, but I don't have a use for these two functions since remember the turret doesn't actually shoot anything, so there's no use for the button. Lastly, moving to the back of the control unit. On this side are two USB ports. The bottom port is what connects to the turret using a USB wire. But the top port can be connected to a computer, and then the Raspberry Pi Pico on the inside can be programmed using the top port. On the other side is a power switch that switches the entire unit on and off. It's just a simple power switch back and cut to power. So now I'll move on to the internal parts of this control unit. Again, all I have are some pictures, so here are a few showing the internal connections. You can see that some connections are soldered directly onto the components, like these potentiometers, and the other side of these wires connects directly to header pins on the circuit board. However, most components already have header pins on themselves, so they can just be connected directly using header pins to the circuit board. And here's what the underside of the circuit board looks like. It's a complete mess of 30 gauge wire. And I've decided for this project to, instead of making a PCB, to test my own soldering and wiring skills. And I've chosen to use physical wires to connect all the components on the circuit board. Not only does the circuit board act as a place for all the components on the top panel to connect to, it also contains the 74HC4051 chip, which all the analog inputs connect to. 
This chip reduces the number of analog inputs that are needed on the Raspberry Pi Pico, and a full explanation of how it works can be seen in the video explaining the code. The remaining digital signals, of course, are connected directly on the circuit board to the Raspberry Pi Pico. And now I'll move on to showing the schematics of the circuit board and how all the components connect to each other. This is the schematics of the circuit board where all the components connect as well as the Raspberry Pi Pico. It's drawn using the open source software KiCad, but it's not 100% identical to what I have actually built. I have made a few modifications that aren't reflected here. So of course the center of the entire thing is the Raspberry Pi Pico with all of its pins. And of course I, I won't be going over the power pins um, and the power is just directly supplied by a battery and uh, stepped down to 5 volts by this 7805 voltage regulator chip. Now it says it's 9 volts here, it's not actually 9 volts. I've instead used 5 different 1.5 volt batteries in series, so it's 7.5 volts. Over here are the two OLED modules, and there are two I2C pins, each connects to the I2C bus on the Raspberry Pi Pico. This is the 74HC451 chip, which all the analog inputs connect to. The other side of the chip has one connection to an analog input pin, and three other connections to three digital pins. For a more detailed explanation on how this chip works, you can watch the video explaining the code. Here are the two dial switches. One of their pins, the common pin, is connected directly to power and the other three pins are connected to three digital pins. Here is the switch controlling manual or auto mode, and that's simply connected to a digital pin. And lastly, pin 14 and pin 15 are connected to the USB port, and through the USB wire, they control the servos. And that concludes the explanation of the schematic, as well as the video itself. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, and the links to the other videos can be seen right now here on screen as well as in the description below. I hope you've enjoyed the video.